we are a few minutes to start, so um, pretty soon I'll call on muted. Okay, doctor, thank you very much. Um, I call to order the Braintree School Committee meeting of April 27th, 2020. The purpose of this meeting is a public hearing to bring forth our fiscal budget for the year 2021. Um, I will entertain a motion to move into an open public hearing. And so moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second. I must do a roll call vote, vote on this. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Soros. Yay. Ms. LaMere. Aye. Ms. Dolan. Aye. Mr. Kakouris. Aye. Mr. Chafe. Aye. And the uh, chair votes aye. Uh, we will move into a public hearing, uh, thereby putting forth a presentation for this year's, uh, actually, I'm sorry, next year's recommended budget. Uh, Dr. Hackett, take it away. Well, good evening again, everybody. Um, so tonight is a uh, it's going to be a very similar presentation that uh, you had to endure the other night with me talking way too much and more than I uh, want to, uh, but uh, you've all come back. So um, I won't take that as a, uh, a vote of confidence or um, interest, but uh, we're doing this again. Um, so just a couple of things <clears throat> from the agenda. Um, what we are going to do tonight, we're going to, we're going to run through the budget again. Uh, nothing has changed from the presentation that you had last time. Then the chair, uh, Chair Devin, will ask for questions from the school committee. Um, and then we will turn to questions from the public. So four public uh, uh, questions. If you are joining us by, um, on the Zoom app, I say by voice, but on the Zoom app, um, what you will do is you will click raise your hand in the webinar controls. Uh, you'll be called on in the order that we received uh, your hand being raised. And before speaking, we would just ask that you please state your name and address. If you are joining us uh, by voicemail, by call, I mean, then you can text your full name, address, and your comment to this number, 781-519-9296. Again, that number is 781 519 and we will receive that, uh, your question, and uh, we'll read it out loud and do the best we can to answer it or at least enter any concern uh, or question into the record. So with that, um, I would like to pull up the um, FY21 recommended budget. And I would just ask if um, the chair of the Finance and Operations Subcommittee, Mr. Kakoris, uh, if you wanted to start this off, or would you want me to, to go ahead and begin? Thank you, Dr. Hackett. Um, I'll let you go ahead and run through the presentation for those folks that are seeing it for the first time. And then I'll reserve my comments till we get to the uh, question and answer period. So thank you. Certainly. Well, here we go. Um, you're in for a treat, um, sarcastically. What we have started out, and we've done this every single year, is to give everybody a snapshot of our enrollment because our enrollment really does drive a lot of what we do from this perspective of uh, classroom instructional teachers and supports. Uh, people, we've been uh, working on our enrollment for year over year, particularly for the middle school projects. Um, and uh, we wanted to show, because there have been some questions over uh, the last few months about whether our enrollment's increasing and decreasing particularly at the elementary level as we begin the process of planning to move uh, fifth grade from Ross, Flaherty, Morrison, and Hollis into East Middle School next year. So this is a 10-year uh, picture. These are October 1 enrollment counts, which is the date that we have to submit our official enrollment, enrollment to the um, Department of Education at the state level. You can see from 2009, we were at 5,377 students. Well, we had a... Uh, Fairly significant, but uh, gradual at the same time, uh, increase over the last 10 years. And we are currently, well, in October of 2001, uh, I'm sorry, October of 2019, 
we, uh, we reached 5,795 students, which is a, a little bit of a decrease from last year. Sometimes these numbers can change and they do change uh, daily or weekly. So it's not uncommon for us to see, uh, see a shift of 10 or 15 kids from one month to the next. Um, particularly uh, when we, uh, generally when we, when we were in session, uh, when we started to get into the spring, we often saw our enrollment increase. This is a breakdown by, uh, by grade span. Find this to be helpful just so we can kind of see where the numbers are and where the uh, trends are. You can see that the top one is all of our elementary school student population. 2009, we're at 5, uh, 2,546. And 2019, October 1 again, we're at 2,521. That is a, a bit of a drop from last year, which is um, not unexpected. Um, as we see, we're seeing a bubble move out of the elementary school into the middle school. Um, and then you can see on the orange uh, line, midway down, we've gone from in 2009, 1,464 students at the high school to 1,715 students uh, in 2019. We are gonna see that number increase again next year, and we will see an increase over the next three years as our bubble that's in fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade makes its way into the high school. Our current fifth grade is the largest class that we have of almost 500 students at that grade level. At the, um, uh, the, the bottom line is the middle school. Again, 1,241 students in 2009 to 1,446 students in 2019. This is a breakdown by school, which again, we find to be helpful because uh, we know that we have different enrollment, tre enrollment trends at different, uh, at different schools in different parts of our town. More specifically, uh, Liberty and High, um, Highlands generally in the last several years has, has been, um, we've seen some increases there. Uh, Morrison has, has kind of been up and down uh, and that is true historically. And um, you can see that Flaherty and Ross are both declining enrollment and have been um, for the last couple of years. We're gonna need to keep an eye on that. I would point out that Liberty, that enrollment dropped from 460 in 2017 to 401 in 2019 is actually the result of us uh, implementing the flexible boundary zones policy, which uh, we have actually sent about 60 students to, uh, to Hollis um, in order to control the population growth at Liberty because we were just running out of spaces. Um, Hollis, again, is increased a little bit, but not tremendously. And if you think about the fact that we have Liberty students there, then if we had not done that, Hollis actually would be currently underutilized as a building. Uh, Highlands, we can see Highlands growth pattern. Then you go down to Flaherty and Ross, um, and you can see some significant drops. And I think it's also important to point out that we are gonna be moving the fifth grade um, from Flaherty and Ross to East Middle School next year. So those numbers are gonna drop again. Uh, now, both of those buildings are pretty maxed out in terms of spaces. They, neither one of them has um, a dedicated art, music, or uh, media center space. Um, so they will gain back some spaces that they, that they definitely need to have, which is obviously a good thing. Our demographic has changed pretty dramatically. Uh, if you take a, this is just a snapshot of the school year 97-98 on the uh, first column. Uh, that is the percentage of, of our students that, that are uh, within each of those um, categories. And then you can see far all the way over to the right, the percentage that are in each one of those categories in 1920, the current school year that we're in. So as you just kind of go down through um, from, African-American, Asian, Hispanic, Native American, white. Um, you can see that if you just take, for example, the, the row um, that has a white percentage in it, in 97, 98, uh, our students were 93.5% of them were white. And the year that we're in, we're at 67.2%, which is obviously a significant change. Uh, you, also, you also can see on the Asian um, population um, row, we've gone from 2.9% of our students um, who are Asian to 21.6% in, in uh, 2019 and 20. 
with that, um, there, we've had to really um, make adjustments to make sure that all of our students are the services that they deserve and that they need. Uh, that has been, uh, it, in some instances, a bit of a budget driver for us from making sure that we're offering uh, students who, who, do, who do not speak English or their families who don't speak English or uh, for whom English is not their first language, the services that they need to access their education and uh, services to the families to make sure that, that, they, uh, that we're interacting with them and communicating with, with them uh, in, the, in the way that uh, they can help support and advocate for their child. Uh, as you go through this chart, this is, again, it's just another look at the actual number, number of English language learners by each school. Uh, one of our challenges has been that our population isn't in one school, so uh, the services that are needed aren't in any one school, and uh, trying to uh, ser provide the services across the district when there isn't necessarily uh, enough uh, service needs in any one particular school that we hire full-time staff means that we have uh, quite a few of our people who actually are traveling between buildings. And we know that every time we have a, a traveling staff member, we lose 0 .2, uh, 0.2 of them, uh, of their full-time equivalent position to travel, which uh, unfortunately, you know, makes it uh, less efficient, but that is uh, the way that um, students and service needs are distributed. So in 15-16, we had 228 students who uh, English was not their first language. And in 1920, again, the year that we're in, we have 339. So a very significant increase from 2015-16, um, not too many years ago, uh, we've gained uh, over 100 students. This is the percentage of our population receiving EL services. So these are the students that actually uh, need additional services and supports to access education. You can see from 2013, we went from 2.6% to the current year of 5.8%. The percent next, the column next to it shows that same, um, that's, that same um, need at the state level. So 7.7% of state enrollment were receiving EL services in 2013, down to 10.8% uh, in 20. And then the next column over, these are the percentage of our students who actually, uh, English is not their first language. Not all of them obviously are receiving EL services, but English is not their first language. And you can see that's gone from 7.9% to 18.4%, which is not too far now behind uh, the state average, which I, you know, from, just from a relative perspective is, is a pretty significant gain. Any questions on, from the committee on um, any of these data? I'm all set, doctor, thank you. Okay, I'll continue on. Give you a quick summary of the fiscal year 2018, 19, and 20. This is, uh, these next few slides are essentially the, the adjustments and additions that we've, we've added to uh, program, provide the programming needs that, for our students that we've needed to provide. In 2018, and I think just to point out from the beginning, the majority of what you will see in these next three slides is our continued effort to build capacity for special services programming within the district. A good example of that is the ABLES program that we created, uh, second row down, for our middle school, incoming middle school population. These are students with, um, who receive special services uh, who were in the elementary level, they are now, they've now, are, were in 2018 coming into the middle school, and we had to quite literally from scratch build a program for them to um, be able to access um, middle school, middle level education. So you can see that it is not cheap to put together a high quality program. Uh, there's a lot of things that come with it. Um, and, you know, we take that very seriously and we put ourselves up against anybody in terms of what we provide, including collaboratives that's, that, uh, that are around us. I would just say also that if um, any one of these students were in a collaborative, the, the generally it's about sixty-five dollars to $75,000 per student for them for tuition for students to be within a collaborative program, uh, which uh, doesn't even include transportation to the collaborative. Our priority is to keep Braintree kids in Braintree. We believe very strongly in that. It, it's a huge benefit, not only to the child, to the family, but to all of our children uh, to be able to have uh, access and, and make friends with and um, help and understand um, the, the needs of others. So 
Um, we take a lot of pride in that. Um, and in this particular case, this, this program was at South Middle School. And that year we actually had to add the modular unit in order to not just accommodate this program, but accommodate um, a, a growing population at South Middle School um, going in FY18. Additionally, I would just show that we also added some funding for translation interpretation services. This is for uh, to be in compliance with legal requirements that all of our vital documents are translated into our top four languages. Uh, that includes student handbooks, policies, um, and any kind of special education material, including IEP documentation. We also have a uh, phone service, interpretation service that it, our, our, our uh, teachers can use with parents if they're use, uh, having a parent meeting, if uh, an IEP meeting. We can use it for even registering students if um, the parents um, who are trying to try to communicate with us about their child don't speak English. So that that is an ongoing service that we provide. In, uh, in uh, FY19, we again uh, we added to our developmental program at Morrison um, Elementary School, um, added to our Strides program at the high school. Um, so those were the couple of the fairly significant ads in that fiscal year, but we also added a guidance counselor at the high school, which was much needed, bringing our caseload down from 315 uh, students to one counselor down to the national recommended average of 260 to one, which is, was a significant help in their families, as well as our, our guidance staff. Uh, that year, we also added a, a biology teacher and an additional section of full day kindergarten at Hollis, um, which was offset um, in part by uh, the tuition charge uh, for a full day day. And in the year that we're in, these have been really, um, these were the, the main ads to our budget. And when I say ads, I, I mean, I don't necessarily mean that, as you will see in the, in the recommendation for FY21, just because we add doesn't mean we're not taking away in other places. So um, that will become uh, more clear in, as I go through the FY21 recommended budget. Um, in this particular year, we added the transition program for special education students who are essentially our postgraduate program, including a, a, a transition coordinator. I'm very fortunate. Um, have, the town has been um, outstanding working with us to create that space right here on uh, 90 Pond, uh, at Pond Street. And um, that program is more of a transition to community-based learning, to uh, job skills, um, and transitioning into adult but for this population of students. In this year, we also were able to add a facilities manager. That addition was the result of actually cutting, eliminating a, a one and a half full-time equivalent positions, one of which was a, a, a full year uh, administrative assistant position. Um, when we eliminated that 1.5, we actually had more money than we needed. Um, to create the facilities manager position, which has been critical for us in really trying to keep up with our facilities, uh, supervise our custodial staff and our, and our maintenance staff. So for FY21, the recommended budget, currently our approved FY20 budget sits at $70,628,795. In January, specifically January 3rd, when we did our first initial level service rollover budget, which means it is a very rough draft. Um, it needs, um, always needs a lot of cleanup, but that initial number uh, was 73,769.70, which is uh, represented at that time a 4.4% increase. As we work through that and continue to um, uh, really get uh, the numbers down and uh, hone in on all of our priorities, we um, we're able to get that down to a 3.95% budget, which is the really the first budget that we brought forward in any meaningful way to talk to um, the Finance and Operations Subcommittee, as well as the school committee about. Um, then uh, we continue to work uh, in partnership with um, the town and in conversations with uh, Mayor Picoris, um, understanding that the total town picture uh, and recognizing that, you know, we are in a very fortunate place at 3.67%, uh, but uh, that we did um, need to make sure that we were, as a town, coming in at a number that would be supportable for the entire community. Uh, and that's when we worked the budget even more and brought it down to that number. And I'll show you how we got there in the, in the next slides. So I'm going to show you 
Now we went from 4.47%, the level services budget, to the recommended budget of 3.67%. The first thing I want to talk about is um, the fact that we have um, some needs next year, going into next year, that are actually additions to the budget uh, for a total of $567,258. The biggest of which is um, for East Middle School. We're going to be Going into that building next year with the new fifth graders coming in, uh, we'll be approaching 1,100, if not a little bit more than 1,100 students. Um, we uh, need to staff that appropriately. That's a significant increase in population. And I have a, the next slide will give you a breakdown on that $333,000. We, uh, the next ad, um, and these are the larger drivers, uh, when I say ads, uh, uh, specialized par paraprofessional contracts, we have negotiated a differential in hourly rate for our specialized program pairs. What we find is that the pairs that come in to these district-wide programs are generally licensed teachers and um, we provide them some significant training to work with uh, a population of students that has high needs. Um, and it, you know, we were losing them um, after the training, getting them in there into the programs. We're really trying to incentivize people to stay with us because there's a cost in losing um, high quality staff like that. So that is a differential in pay from the pair, uh, general education pair rate. Our special education transportation vendor costs went up by about $85,000. There's a lot of uh, factors behind this, uh, not the least of which is where we transport particular students to. These generally would be beyond our, our these are not generally our co um, cooperative program kids. These are generally residential placement students depending on the travel time, uh, the time of day that students have to travel, some of which um, are right through this, the, the middle of the city, um, it, it um, drives that number. We have an increase in our tuition reimbursement bank. This is for um, BEA members, teachers, uh, to take coursework. We want our, our teachers to continue their learning and uh, we want to cover their um, tuition uh, rate at, in a way that is fair enough and, and reasonable enough that they will be able to take the courses uh, that they need to have, not only to stay licensed, but also to pursue um, additional degree work. Our non-instructional software maintenance costs, uh, we've added facilities due as part of the East Middle School project, anticipation of hopefully the South project as well. This is a, um, facilities due is a very powerful program. This is, a, we have been using school due. This is a significant upgrade for us. It is in line with what the town facilities department uses. Uh, and we're hoping to create some more cross synergy with the town uh, in and around facilities. The mayor and I have spoken about that. Um, I think that, you know, we probably could do better uh, more efficiently um, with a little bit more partnering and a little bit um, more coordination. Uh, this program will help us do some of that. One of the things that this program offers is our ability to take, for example, the East Middle School as built, uh, put them into this, this um, program and we can have a custodian walk in or anybody walk into a room that has access to this program with a, with a phone, uh, scan a code in, a, in any individual room, and it will tell us everything from the color of the paint on that wall for a, a room to the type of light fixture that's, uh, that's in the ceiling so that we can really start to try to coordinate even district-wide that we're buying the same type of light fixture so that we can uh, maximize our costs by really uh, trying to buy, uh, do things in a more efficient uh, way in buying bulk. And the final item, which was a fairly heavy hitter, is MIIA Insurance, MIA. This is the uh, town's insurance carrier. Most towns and cities across the state uh, work and use MIA. This increase could be the result of a few things. Uh, certainly, it's partly in a change that in our bus premium. Um, and it may also be related to some, some claims that have made, been made over the last couple of years. Uh, it is a pretty sharp increase, uh, but we will continue to work to try to get that down. There are incentive programs that um, the town works hard through uh, Ed Spellman, the finance director, uh, to try to get us into so that we can earn some credits to try to knock some money off of our rates. So, the breakdown of the East staffing needs um, is here. It's pretty self-explanatory. We do need an, an initial assistant principal. It, we cannot bring that many kids into a building and only have one assistant principal. That becomes a safety and security issue. Uh, it also becomes a family outreach and contact issue. Um, 
we do need an additional guidance counselor. That could be an adjustment counselor, but right now we're holding it, uh, the placeholders for a guidance counselor. Again, that's a lot of students coming in that um, we cannot cover their needs with our guide, existing guidance services that uh, currently at East Middle School. We have, we're carrying two additional custodians in this budget. If we're adding 74,000 square feet of space next year when both, um, both the renovated and new portion of the buildings are open, and we certainly want to make sure that we're protecting that asset, keeping it clean, uh, getting off the right start there. Um, just the square footage alone is justification for at least two, probably could justify one or two more. Uh, we are also adding a 0.2 art, a 0.4 music, and a 0.2 PE teacher. These are actually ads at the elementary level. As uh, Assistant Superintendent Lee worked with the directors and the, uh, and the principals to get the staffing set for a five to eight East Middle School going through everybody's licensure, trying to find out, who, you know, volunteers to go and then trying to figure out the match of fifth graders going, uh, fifth grade teachers going to the middle school as well as um, others. Um, it, it was a two year process in the making and the fact that we're able to um, come down to a need of really only three part-time positions to cover that uh, change is uh, actually quite extraordinary. So it just done a, a ton of work and a great job done by our staff to get there. So that total of $333,454, again, is here on this first row and part of the $567,000 ad. Now we added, uh, so now to, to get down to 3.67%, we need to cut more than, um, more than our initial starting point. These are the list of cuts um, that we've made in the FY21 recommended budget. The first one is a uh, central office position, a director of personnel and student services. Um, this position um, handled a, a lot of work around with some of the things, we, the programs we were talking about earlier, English language learner programs, uh, Title I programming, uh, and it also handled a, a lot of personnel issues. Uh, that position has been vacant this year, uh, where we chose not to fill it in anticipation of not knowing what was gonna happen in FY21, and uh, we are making that reduction going in FY, I'm sorry, FY21. The second one is a grade three Liberty teaching position. Our enrollment allows us to make this reduction and we, we'll, we will still enjoy very favorable class sizes. Um, that's a shift that we actually made at Highlands last year. So um, like Highlands, every uh, grade level except one will have four teachers. Uh, this grade three uh, and next year's grade three at Highlands, coincidentally, will have three sections. We made about $118,000 worth of adjustments, various adjustments to the uh, January 3rd level service budget. That was really more just uh, cleaning up early drafts of that budget um, and to uh, get everything um, in line to move into the next phase of our budget process. We spoke about building capacity with our special education programs and district-wide programs in earlier slides. This, is, uh, this next item is a result of our ability to uh, continue to bring and keep students in district. So uh, going in FY21, we are uh, at this point projecting that we can make a reduction of $345,000 to our SPED tuitions line. We all know that that can be a moving target. Anything can happen. We could have students move in during the course of the year next year um, that will require us to um, increase or spend more in, in tuition and we'll, we'll make that adjustment if we have to. We've reallocated about $212,000 to a couple of different grants and revolving accounts, so integrated preschool grant, um, a, a revolving account, SPED administration, uh, and a pre-K teacher, uh, we've moved into a revolving account. We have, uh, we're reducing our HVAC uh, line by $100,000. We believe this is a conservative number. We think we can do more than that, but we, as we, we all know, it was an incredibly mild winter. Um, and we do not have much, uh, we have not obviously going to be able to finish the school year. So we really don't know what those, uh, per, that number is going to look like. So we really want to go and live through another um, season next year and, and get a better handle on um, what we could do with, with potentially reducing that more. This reduction is partly due to uh, the hiring of a uh, replacement of a plumbing position with, with a plumber who has uh, HVAC experience. 
to do a lot of, uh, can do a lot of our low level maintenance work on that. And it's also a result of our energy saving ESCO project, which uh, we believe will, is gonna reduce the need for HVAC maintenance, um, given the fact that we have new boilers in every building. We also made adjustment to a professional development line. Uh, we'll get into the detail of that. And then below are some other various um, reductions that we made for a total of $1,105,872. So when you take the $1,105,000 and you subtract the $567,000, the net difference brings us to the 3.67% down from the initial level services budget of 4.47%. I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, doctor. I believe at this time it's appropriate for questions to come from the school committee. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do you have any? Uh, uh, I have no questions, just a couple of comments, if I may. Please. Thank you, Dr. Hackett. I think, uh, you know, again, given the economic circumstances that we're in, I think that uh, you've put, you've helped us put together the most fiscally responsible budget that we could under these circumstances. I'm really proud of the work that, that you and your team did to keep the teachers and students supported. Um, I know we started this process, it <laughs> seems like a long time ago when things were very different. And, uh, you know, I'm glad that we were able to, as the, you know, conditions changed, I think we really were able to pivot every week in, in our meetings and, and really work with the best information that we had. And I know, you know, some of that information is still not there as far as, you know, how we would bring back our classroom kind of post pandemic. But I think, again, this is a very responsible budget. Um, I appreciate the work that we did with the mayor's office and staff. I think, again, we have a budget that will continue to support excellence in the school system. So I, you know, I look forward to bringing this forward to the full committee later this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kors. Are there any other questions or comments from the school committee? Hearing none, I believe it's, uh, we can open up questions to the public if they have any. All I would ask is, um, you obviously you have to state your name and your address if there are any questions. And again, if uh, you're joining us through the app, um, you just need to click raise your hand in the webinar controls. And if you are joining us uh, via phone, you can text your full name, address and comment to 781-519-9296. Dr. Hackett, are you seeing any movement, you being um, in control? I'm seeing no movement. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, <clears throat> I want to give it a few more minutes. Doctor, can we explain how they get to the raise hand? That may be a, a challenge. Um, I don't know that I can explain that really clearly, but there is in your, um, if Mobile app. I believe it's in the participants. In the webinar control? It's in the bottom, yeah, in the participants uh, box, I believe. The other option, if uh, people do not have any questions tonight, is um, they can email us. Uh, I'll pull this up or call us at the office number, but the email. Uh, is central office at braintreeschools.org and the phone number that uh, that people can call um, is 71-380-0130 after uh, we get through if the this budget is um, approved by the school committee for recommendation to make a course then we will be posting this on our website uh, along with additional information including a line item budget 
um, that people can look at, um, which would be this, basically the same line on budget we're going to be submitting to the mayor and the town council. Okay, um, I don't, I don't believe we're seeing any movement on this. So I know that we've got another meeting following this. I guess I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing for the fiscal year 21 budget. So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion. I have a second. Roll call vote. Mayor Kikoris. I know he was on here before. Um, Ms. Soros? Aye. Ms. Ms. Dolan? Aye. Mr. Kokoris? Aye. Mr. Chave? Aye. And the chairperson votes aye. I believe we have the quorum to be able to close the public meeting. Um, okay, we we'll close that. Now I need a motion to adjourn this meeting. So moved. Okay, we'll go with roll call again. Mr. Mayor? Ms. Soros? Aye. Ms. Lemaire? Aye. Ms. Dolan? Aye. Mr. Kikoris? Aye. Mr. Chave? Aye. And the chairman votes aye. This meeting is now closed. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To stay muted, just um, go ahead and remute yourself, which is a word that I made up uh, about an hour ago. So. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hockett. Um, uh, I call to order the Brinks School Committee of April 27, 2020, uh, in, uh, in order. Um, some of the routine matters we have, uh, I, I believe everyone had the package as far as the minutes of the, our open session of April 23rd, 2020. Um, I'll take a motion to accept those minutes as written. So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second. We will take a roll call vote on that. Mr. Mayor? Aye. Ms. Soros? Aye. Ms. LaMaire? Aye. Ms. Dolan? Aye. Mr. Kokoris? Aye. Mr. Chafe? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That's unanimous that we accept the minutes. We do have one gift approval. Um, a check in of $36.25 from Bay State Textiles. Um, this gift has been donated in support of the mission and vision of the Braintree Public Schools. I'll take a move, motion. Move to accept. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion. I have a second. Mr. Mayor? Aye. Ms. Soros? Aye. Ms. LaMaya? Aye. Ms. Dolan. Aye. Mr. Kokoris. Aye. The chief. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Uh, as always, thank you very much to the people of Braintree with their uh, benevolent and thoughtful gifts that help us to provide better educational opportunities for our children. Next agenda item, um, review of the recommended budget for the fiscal year 2021. Dr. Hackett, if you will. So I would just like to apologize in the front end of this for those of you who have heard me uh, present this about 17 times or what feels like 17 <laughs> times to you. Um, if the truth be known, I'm quite sick of hearing myself talk as well. So I will do the best I can to uh, keep this moving. Um, I appreciate everyone taking the time to uh, join us again tonight and this Finance and Operations Subcommittee met previous to the uh, public hearing that was held about an hour ago, uh, I will just start by asking the chair of the Finance and Operations Committee 
Mr. Kakoris, whether or not he wants to start us off or whether you would like me just to roll right into this. Thank you, Dr. Hackett. I'll let you roll right in and then I'll give an update of the finance and operations recommendation when you finish. I was so hoping that you were going to have a different answer than that. But, um, unless, you, unless you want me to try to... No, no. Try to... <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I wanted to start off by reviewing the enrollment with everybody as part of the presentation. The enrollment um, is a major driver for us and, and uh, determines for a, a good portion of our resources uh, where our money and, and um, is spent based on class sizes and composition of our, our student population. So this is a 10-year look at our enrollment. Uh, from 2009 to 2019, you can see that in 2009, we were 5,377. Uh, and in uh, 2019, and these are October 1, official October 1 state counts. In 2019, October 1, we uh, were at 5,795 students. We generally can fluctuate over the course of uh, any given month, uh, plus or minus 10 or 15 students. Uh, we generally also end the year, the, the school year, um, with a higher enrollment than we start with, uh, but obviously this year is quite a bit different than that, uh, unfortunately. This is the enrollment by grade span. Uh, the top bar, uh, the top line represents all of our elementary students from 2009. Again, the same time frame. We were at 2546 in 2019. We are, uh, we were, and now at 2521. So. I think this is telling only in that we are now a little bit below where we were in 2009, which means um, you know, we're starting to see that downward trend that we're showing up in some of our enrollment projections. We, it looks as though in our projections, we will um, drop a little bit, probably not much more than this, and then we will start to uh, essentially level off. The next line is orange, is the high school. Um, we uh, have gone from 1464, 10 years ago to uh, 1715 in October of one. That is in part, we're starting to see uh, the bubble that was passing through, uh, that passed through the elementary school, although grade five is a, um, has a high enrollment, <coughs> uh, which will be moving in the, into middle school next year. But we also are seeing some higher enrollments uh, entering the high school um, and that bubble from five, six, seven, eight will continue to um, go into the high school. The high school will approach uh, 2,000 students in uh, three or four years. So uh, that is going to be a longer term resource issue for us as we're gonna need to likely add some staffing to accommodate for more students. Uh, the challenge with it is gonna be the fact that we're not losing enough students at the elementary level that we're gonna be really able to shift resources. So. Uh, we'll continue to have to work on um, ways to, to manage that, that growth. And then finally, the green line on the bottom is our middle school enrollment from 1241 to 1446. That will go up again next year as that fifth grade heads into uh, to become sixth graders at both of our middle schools. And obviously, with um, the incoming fifth grade at Flaherty, Hollis, Morrison, and Ross, uh, will be headed to East Middle School. East will be... Um, around 1,100 students when, when we open next year. And uh, you'll see that reflected in some of the uh, budget work that we've done in, in, in this recommended budget. Liberty uh, is the top of this uh, graph. We, this is by independence by each school at the elementary level, what our enrollment has looked like from 2016 to 19. So uh, basically a four-year snapshot. These are again, October 1 enrollment counts. Uh, you can see that uh, Liberty went from, in 2017, from 460 students to, to about 400 students in 2000, October 2019. Just to point out that that is, um, represents the period of time that we implemented the flexible boundary zone policy. So there are almost 60 students who otherwise would have been at Liberty who are now at Hollis. Um, so that's a little bit misleading. Liberty and Highlands um, continue to be our um, higher, higher population, higher growth schools. Um, interestingly, the next line down orange is Hollis. Uh, if they had not received those 60 um, Liberty students, then they, their enrollment projection would actually, they'd be below 400 students. So 
Um, we're getting some movement out of the Hollis district as well. Uh, Highlands had a little bit of a dip, but back up again. And again, these are in, you know, in the, the order of magnitude of these changes of the, the bars are a little bit misleading because you, when you go from 460 to 401, that looks like a lot more of a drop than that. So this is based on a, a 20 point scale. Um, and then Morrison fl has fluctuated some that uh, Morrison tends to kind of go up and down over the course of the year. Uh, there's quite a bit of a transient population that comes in and out of Morrison. Um, and then at the, left, the bottom two are both Flaherty and Ross. And as you can see, uh, we do have some declining enrollments happening there. Um, and as the fifth grade moves out of those two buildings, we uh, will gain some very much uh, needed spaces. We do not have dedicated spaces for library um, and some of our specialist programs. So we also are really kind of, we need the space for um, some SPED programming and confidential classroom, small group environments as well. So. Uh, but those two schools will be dropping again next year as the fifth grade leaves as well as will Hollis um, and Morrison as, as we know. So um, that's where we are across the board at the elementary level. We also have been seeing a changing demographic over the last several years. Um, when we look back in, in uh, 2000, uh, 1997, 1998, you can go down that first column and just see the percentages of each one of those uh, of categories. Um, 2.5 African American, we were 2.9% of our student population in 97, 98 was Asian, 1% 1, 1 Hispanic. Uh, and then 93.5% of our students in the 97, 98 school year uh, were white. Um, as you follow that particular um, category across that, uh, that row, you can see that we've gone from 93.5% white percentage population to 67.2% um, in the current school year. So a fairly significant change in our demographic, our student demographic, which has bought, brought a lot of diversity, um, a lot of new culture, a lot of great opportunities for us. I do believe our greatest strength is in our diversity. And, um, you know, we are continuing to make changes to accommodate, um, to make sure we're meeting the needs of all our students, which has also been a, a longer term budget driver for us as we implement students for students who, uh, implement programs for students who do not, either don't speak English or for whom English is not their uh, first language. Uh, this is just another way to look at, this is by school. These are English language learners by each school from 15, the 15, 16 school year to the 1920 school year. Um, one of the numbers that we obviously have gone from, we've gone from 228 in 1516 to 339 in 2019, uh, 2020, uh, a significant increase. Um, one of the numbers that's, if you just kind of look across the first row from the pre-K center, uh, that is a significant increase over the last several years from six to 18 to 25 to 49, and now dropped down a little bit to 45. Uh, I think it's somewhat telling of what our future is going to hold as we continue to um, see, again, a, a change in our demographic. Um, and then finally, this uh, chart just shows the percentage of our students um, who are enrolled, who are in the first column receiving, receiving English language learner services, that's actual support services for, uh, for our EL students. That's the first column. We've gone from 2.6 to 5.8. Uh, then you can see the state and how we compare against the state for that same classification. The third column over shows the percentage of our students uh, for whom English is not their first language. Um, and that particular column, I think, is quite telling as we've seen a significant increase from 7.9% of our population to 18.4%. These are students who may or may not receive English language services, but English is not their first language. Um, you know, when you just compare the third column to the fourth column and you look at the percentages between us and the state averages, you know, the gap is certainly, um, has certainly closed. We are uh, approaching the state average on uh, students who, um, whose language is, first language is not English. Like just to take a, a quick walk through FY18, FY19 in, in the current budget year that we're in, uh, FY20, this, the purpose of these next slides are really to show 
what we've, uh, the, where the priorities have been, what we have funded kind of above and beyond, um, just rolling our budget forward. And, and um, these are programs that we've been able to add um, over the last three years uh, in services and also staffing we've added to both accommodate for changing enrollment, uh, special education needs, as well as um, um, increased enrollment uh, coming up through our, our K through 12 system. In FY18, these were the approved additions above our level services budget. We added a uh, elementary adjustment counselor. Um, this was primarily for Flaherty district-wide program support. Uh, we created an enables classroom program for, at the middle school level, specifically at uh, South Middle School. This was a program that did not exist at the middle school. It does exist and did exist at um, actually at Flaherty Elementary School. Uh, in the population um, that were that was at Flaherty were coming into the middle school in the uh, um, school year 1718. So this program was created to uh, make sure that to make sure that we were meeting the needs of those students programmatically. You can see that uh, clearly there's a, a cost to building a program like this. We, we take that job very seriously. We hire nothing but the best people to do it um, who uh, really uh, can provide the level of service and, and quality program that we would expect and that our students deserve. Uh, just for some perspective on this, um, if these students were placed out of district at a collaborative placement, each student would, uh, the tuition per student tuition generally runs between sixty-five dollars and $75,000 per student. So there are multiple students who are accessing this program at the time. Um, and uh, so it is important to remember that, you know, not only is it the right thing to do for our students and our families to keep them in Braintree, but um, it's, we also know, and now we also know that we can do a better job than a collaborative could do, uh, respectfully, uh, but it, it's also in our best interest to do it for other reasons. Uh, just uh, to point out one more thing on this particular slide, you can see the second row from the bottom, ELL translation and interpretation services. Uh, this was partially in response to our changing population to make sure we were being, we were in compliance with legal requirements that we were translating all of our vital documents, things like handbooks, uh, policies, um, uh, program of studies, got books at the height from the high school, middle school level, and also providing uh, a phone based interpretation services for when we had meetings with families who needed interpretation or we needed to have interpreted for us so that we could communicate effectively. In FY19, these are the items that were approved beyond our level services budget. Uh, again, um, Morrison Elementary added a, a developmental one program, an additional program. It was based on student need. It was based on enrollment. That is a special services program. Additionally, we added a, uh, a 1.0 position, teaching position for our BHS STRIES program. Uh, these are students who are on a um, spectrum disorder program. And we added some additional resource across the board um, for other uh, special education services and programs. We also in that year added a guidance council at the high school, dropping our current our caseload at the time of 315 students to one counselor down to 260 students to one counselor, which was at the, uh, the national uh, recommended level for, for school counseling and it made a tremendous difference for, for student staff and, and certainly for parents. Um, in that year, we also added an additional kindergarten, full day kindergarten section, which uh, we were able to net out some based on the, the uh, revenue that comes with that, the tuition based revenue. And we added a biology teacher at, uh, at the high school. FY20, these were, this is the current year that we're in, the fiscal year that we're in. These were the additions, but beyond our level services budget, um, you know, we added the special education postgraduate program on Pond Street, as many of you are aware, uh, in coordination with the town and town facilities and the mayor's office, we're able to create a space outside of the high school for students who essentially were, um, the high school placement was really, is really no longer appropriate for. Uh, this program really bases, uh, um, is based in more community outreach, community-based learning, uh, job skill and transitions for our, these, these students to, to uh, work their way into uh, adult life. Uh, so we're very proud of that program. Tremendous uh, staff put that together and just done an outstanding job um, for this population of students. Um, we had a couple other smaller ads, but important ones. Uh, in addition, we were able to restructure 
um, our, our a couple of positions within our, our budget uh, as a result of a couple of different different things happening. Uh, we eliminated uh, one and a half full time positions to create a 1.0 facilities manager. Still stay, saved money in that process, but uh, gained so much in being able to have one person who is um, overseeing our custodial staff as well as our maintenance staff. Uh, can coordinate with out, uh, outside contractors to take care of issues when they come up and uh, just also really able to give us a more of a high level planning um, and, and district wide perspective on what we need within our facilities. So for the FY21 recommended budget, we are sitting in a budget right now in FY20 of $70,628,795. Um, when we first uh, administratively worked on the budget here in the office during Christmas vacation week and prior to that the process starts with our administrators early in the fall um, from directors working with assistant superintendent Lee uh, principals working with both of us to identify their needs uh, to figure out where they want to uh, prioritize and what they want to spend money on for their supply allocated supply lines and equipment lines technology special education other departments the initial pass at that budget um, was a 4.47% increase. Again, that's, you know, that is the budget that we worked on in the central office that, that marked our starting point. Uh, there, it's, uh, it is truly a rough draft. There's a lot of cleanup that happens from that point forward. Um, we then worked administratively to bring that budget to um, the 3.95% preliminary draft budget. That was the budget that we spent time with that uh, with the finance and operations subcommittee um, report a little bit back and forth to the school committee just in terms of where we were in the process and continue to work through that that number um, and try to really um, hone in on whether or not there are any op other opportunities to um, to be more efficient uh, and then uh, as we continue to work through and in coordination with uh, town halls more specifically mayor for course spent a lot of time talking about where we were as a town. We are a department of the town. We do have an independent elected school committee and we have our own budget and we have uh, fiscal autonomy and policy autonomy, but we are a department of the, uh, of the town. And we've always had that approach as, as you have as a school committee member administratively, we recognize that you know, there is only one so-called pool of money for the town of Raintree. And we, I, I think have been and, and always want to be good partners in that process. Um, so uh, fortunately, as, uh, as the mayor worked through um, what has been an incredibly tricky, uh, dynamic um, <laughs> few months, uh, trying to figure out and project uh, what revenues are gonna look like for next year, um, which is a, a very difficult task in the climate that we're in, obviously. Um, we were able to uh, go look more into our budget, try to find other ways we could put be more efficient um, and now we're in front of you with this recommended budget that it represents a 3.67% increase. Um, to say, to get to the 3.67%, there were certain things we had to add. We know we're going into East Middle School with our fifth graders next year, for example. So that really was a, a, um, a very high, our highest priority to make sure we're staffing that building from the very beginning, from opening the doors on 74,000 more square feet of space uh, and fifth graders being at that school, that we are staffing it in the way that our community and our parents would expect and the way that our students deserve. So uh, while we had, while we made some additions to make sure that that goes as, as smoothly, uh, we've also um, in the process made some reductions in order to um, get to that 3.67% number while also trying to um, make sure we uh, accommodated those, those priorities. So. This slide here, uh, what I will show you in the next few slides is how we got from the level of service of 4.47% to the recommended budget of 3.67%. We'll start with the adjustments, the additions that we, that we added uh, based on our priorities. The first one was, as I said before, the needs of um, East Middle School and opening, it, opening that building. Uh, I, the next slide will show you a breakdown of the $333,000 uh, in detail. We uh, have a few other things on this list that we needed to make adjustments for from um, some contractual um, um, changes within the uh, bargaining agreement. 
Uh, specifically, the next one is specialized pairs. Uh, our, we, our pair professionals that work within our district-wide programs are going to be receiving a differential for um, their work starting next year if they are designated as a specialized pair professional. That differential is intended to recognize the fact that the um, that the requirements and the demands of, of the our district-wide programs are um, different, and um, they also uh, require us to have pairs who are trained in some uh, in some things that techniques and skill sets that are necessary for our district-wide program students. Uh, we often find that most of our pairs in these programs are licensed teachers and we really, it's in our best interest to keep them with us because we spend so much time trying to find the right people for the right spots. Sometimes it's kid specific um, and we don't want to lose them to teaching jobs elsewhere. So that's what this differential seeks to accomplish. We've increased in special education transportation vendors. That's due to a variety of factors from distance travel to time needed to get to certain out of district placements. These are generally placements uh, that are residential in terms of what's driving that cost the most. Um, and then we increased our tuition reimbursement bank for, for teachers and other um, staff within the BEA contract to, to continue their coursework. We were falling behind um, in how much we were reimbursing teachers on a per credit basis, given the uh, increases that were happening at the college level for graduate level coursework. So that is an adjustment to that. The next item is uh, non-instructional software. This is facilities due. It's also used by the town of Raintree. Uh, we were using the um, legacy version of this, which was at the time called School Dude. Um, which don't, I don't really understand the choice of um, um, title, but that's what it is. This is a significant upgrade for us and it'll allow us to do um, both preventative maintenance, uh, event tracking, um, and also become much more efficient in how we um, plan out our needs from a facility standpoint, from both supplies and, and projects that need, we need to accomplish also bringing East Middle School a brand new building online next year. All the information about all of our systems for that school will be dumped into this software, uh, as well as all the information from our ESCO energy savings project, which uh, put new boilers uh, and other uh, systems in each one of our schools. So um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a little bit of money, but it, um, we are quite, quite confident that in the long run, it will save us um, more than that. And then we had an increase in our MII insurance, my insurance. Um, this was um, the town of Rangery uh, carries their insurance through Maya. Most, most uh, towns and, and uh, cities do in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And this increases for uh, a, a variety of things that have happened over the last couple of years. We will continue to try to work to find ways to, to reduce that over time. So that total is 567000 $258. These are the East additions. Uh, we no doubt need a, another assistant principal from a safety and security standpoint with adding that many students, more students to the building. Uh, we will open with about 1,100 students at East Middle School in the fall. We, along the same line, we need a, an additional guidance counselor or, social, or uh, adjustment counselor uh, to make sure that we're providing the services we need to to our students and to our families the support staining and as well as to our teachers who are working with students um, who have a variety of level of needs. We are, uh, this budget carries two additional custodians for East Middle School, um, 74,000 more square feet of space. We probably could use three or four, but this is gonna go a long way for us in terms of trying to make sure that that building is uh, kept not only clean, but in the condition um, that we would want it to as a brand new asset in the town. Um, and then the, the partial position as art, music, and PE are the result of us um, changing uh, the staffing to staff a five through eight East Middle School. These actual partial additions will be actually at the elementary level as offsets to, uh, to partial pos to positions we had to bring in the East to provide the programming for that many more students. Uh, this was a tremendous amount of work done under the direction of Assistant Superintendent Lee with the directors and principals. Uh, literally two years of going through every single staff member, looking at licensure, trying to figure out 
uh, who wants to go where, who needs to go where, um, and a, a great effort. Um, and we are in a really good place for the fall of, um, of, of 2020 as we, as we open that brand new facility. So that is the total for the 333,000 that you saw on this slide in the top row and part of that addition of the uh, $567,000 uh, that you see on the bottom row of slide 15. So the next slide to make sure that we, we did the ads, but now we have to do the reductions to, to bring that, get us to the 3.67% recommended budget. Uh, these, re these are the, the bulk of the reductions that we made. The first one is a director of personnel and student services position. That is a position within the central office that uh, manage uh, English language learner programs, um, Title I programming, other su support student services, as well as personnel. Um, that position was held open this year. We did not fill it um, in anticipation of, of, of knowing that we might be headed into some difficult budgeting over the next couple of years, especially knowing we were gonna have to staff East uh, so we are eliminating that position from the central office. Again, it was an open position. There's nobody currently in the job, so it doesn't represent a, a personnel cut, but it does represent a cut in uh, central office service uh, to the school department. We are also going to reduce a grade three position at Liberty School. Uh, it is based on enrollment. We will still be able to enjoy very favorable class sizes. We made a similar uh, reduction last uh, in the year that we're going into this year at Highlands. Uh, also, um, that will be moving into the third grade at Highlands next year. Um, but uh, we always keep an eye on enrollments and we make these adjustments when we are confident that we can do this and still maintain very favorable class sizes and high quality within the classroom. Um, the next row are just several cleanup adjustments that we made to our January 3rd level services budget at the administrative level. Once we roll everything over, um, you know, going through the salary books, making sure that everyone's in the right position, anticipating retirements, um, new information from January 3rd to the point we are right now. Uh, it's a, you know, it's a moving target for a few months. So um, that represents 117,000 just cleanups that uh, helped get us to the initial 3.95 um, yeah, preliminary budget, excuse me. Um, and then we were able to also reduce our SPED tuitions by $345,000, which uh, is a good um, uh, demonstration or example of uh, cost savings that we realize when we put and invest uh, in our own people to build capacity in district to keep our students in Braintree uh, that, that is uh, truly a, 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 an offset of those efforts, as well as some um, enrollment changes within our special education population. Then we did reallocate some of our expenses to some grant and revolving accounts from integrated preschool, SPED administration, and our, our pre-K teacher that were uh, moved into a revolving account based on um, some revenue projections within those accounts. We reduced our HVAC by $100,000, anticipating that the ESCO Energy Savings Project is going to deliver more than that kind of savings. But we did not obviously have a, a it was a very mild winter this year. And we've not, uh, unfortunately, in, in uh, the school closure, we're not going to have a full year's worth of data as to how much the Energy Savings Project is going to save us. Um, so this is a conservative number. And um, as we go through next year, we'll have a better sense for what we can do in FY22. We are anticipating that we're going to be able to make more of a reduction going into that fiscal year, given all the work that's been done within our buildings. Um, so we will, um, again, that's a conservative estimate. We uh, also were able to uh, make a reduction in professional development. We had a contract with a company that was working with our staff on developing um, the workshop model. Uh, it was a very intensive professional development experience with uh, outside consultants coming into classrooms, teachers going into each other's classroom it was an entire model that we have spent a lot of energy on um, and staff has done a great job with. Um, but uh, we are near, we are near three right now, I believe, going into year four and that's a reduction that we know we can make. The idea was that we would not continue to need this particular contract as we uh, build capacity within our staff. Um, we can uh, lean away from uh, having an outside consultants come in and, and do this work with us. 
And then the remainder of these reductions is uh, relatively small for a total of 1,105,872. So with that $1.1 million reduction, netting out the $567,000 addition brings us from the 4.47% January 3rd budget to the recommended budget of 3.67%. And I would be happy to answer any questions and I'm very glad that I'm done talking. Thank you, Dr. Hackett. Uh, are there any comments or questions from people from the school committee? Mr. Chair? By all means, Mr. Kokoros, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hackett. Um, I want to just give the school committee an update that the finance and operations subcommittee did meet prior to the public hearing, and we unanimously, unanimously approved this uh, budget. We think it's fiscally responsible, and we think it provides the level of service that will continue the excellence in our school system. So we thank the administration and the mayor's office for working together with us to come to this number and hopefully we will be able to approve this uh, later this evening. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kukoros. Any other comments or questions? Mr. Chairman? By all means, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just wanted to uh, thank um, Dr. Hackett and his team uh, as well as uh, Mr. Kokoris uh, on the committee. Uh, I will say that uh, we started, uh, Dr. Hackett and I started talking about the budget sometime back in November, sometime after a particular election was over. Uh, we met uh, within days and um, it's been a long process and it's been a great process and it's been wonderful to work with Dr. Hackett and uh, work through uh, the numbers. And then um, when we finally uh, got to a, a point where uh, we started to um, come to um, some numbers on the budget, we get struck with the coronavirus, um, which um, quite frankly has been, it's been obviously devastating to uh, our town. Um, in the case of the number of cases and, and deaths that we've had but in addition to that, it's been an economic disaster. And I have to commend uh, Dr. Hackett uh, for his ability to work with us and work the numbers and um, come out with a budget that maintains the best level of education for our children in Braintree uh, while uh, bringing the numbers within the budget um, in a very conservative budget overall that we will be proposing and presenting tomorrow night to the council. Um, but I, I, I really have to thank him and his team for all of the hours put in and um, all of the work to get to this point. And I know that every one of you um, have done your job and done it well. And I just want to say, as a mayor of town of Brantree, I, I thank all of you and look forward to uh, hopefully having this approved tonight and presenting it to the council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have a couple of comments too. Uh, and I say it almost every single year and it, it's said for the people of Braintree so that they'll realize that this budgetary process in a normal year, and let's face it, 2020 is not shaping up to be a normal year, but in a no normal year's process, we have two things that are unknowns. We have to put together a budget not knowing how many students are gonna show up in the first week of September and say, please educate me. And we're duty bound to do that. So we come up with a budget this year, knowing that we don't know how many students are gonna come up and knock on our doors. Another thing we uh, don't know is what we can expect for state funding. So in a normal year, that's a, a, a daunting task. And now with what we're going through, um, yes, you have to commend the mayor's office our administration office, the fact that um, we have the right people in place on this school committee, um, the leadership that we have gotten from uh, Mr. Kokoros as the uh, chairman of a budgetary and operations subcommittee, uh, Ms. Soros, uh, who has brought herself up to speed rather quickly, and, you know, and, and others, others who have supported us. Um, and I think that speaks to the strength we have because of the membership we have here. 
So each and every one of you on the school committee and the mayor's office and all this, thank you very much for making this as easy as it could be, in spite of the fact that there are some difficult things we're dealing with right now. So thank you very much. I believe where we are right now is, uh, I will be reading off the different articles. Um, we have 10 votes we have to take, but you know, there are, there are 11 votes we have to take, but there are 10 articles, individual articles. At this time, what I will do is I will read off the, uh, the, the listing of the article and the amount of money we have in it. At that point in time, I will ask for a motion to accept or, or, or second it. And then at the very end of those 10 articles, we'll do a roll call vote. And then we will do a, a, a total fiscal year uh, 2021 Braintree School budget, which will have the total number. Unless there are any comments or questions. Okay, hearing none, we'll proceed. <clears throat> Article one, elementary school administration, $1,527,194. Do I have a motion? Move, move to accept. Okay, I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Middle school administration, $985,832. Move to accept. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I second. Okay, we have a second. High school administration, one million one hundred sixty-eight thousand one hundred fourteen dollars. Move to accept. Do I have a second? Second. Curriculum and instruction, fifty-four million. Nine hundred seventy-nine thousand seven hundred eighteen. Move to accept. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Curriculum and professional development. Two hundred sixty-nine thousand two hundred fifteen. Move to accept. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Thank you. Article six. Buildings and grounds maintenance and utilities. Five million one hundred sixty thousand six hundred thirty-one dollars. Move to accept. Do I have a second? Aye. Okay. Number seven, general education and transportation. Tra excuse me, general education and transportation. One million six hundred and sixteen thousand nine hundred forty-five dollars. Move to accept. Second. Yes. Number eight. Athletics, eight hundred twenty-four thousand seven hundred eighty-two. Move to accept. Second. Second. Number nine. All other district-wide services, five million three hundred sixty-five thousand eight hundred nine dollars. Move to accept. Thank Second. Second. Number ten. Technology and data processing. One million three hundred and twenty thousand six hundred and sixty two dollars. Move to accept. Second. Okay. Total fiscal year twenty twenty one Braintree Public School budget seventy three million two hundred and eighteen thousand nine hundred and two dollars. Move to accept. Second. Have a second. Okay. Time for our roll call vote. Mr. Mayor. Aye. Ms. Soros. Aye. Ms. LaMea. Aye. Ms. Dolan. Aye. Mr. Kokoros. Aye. Mr. Chafe. Aye. And the chair votes aye. That's unanimous. People, thank you very much for all the hard work. It's greatly appreciated. You're to be commended. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, next uh, item is public comment. I believe this is the point where we open things up to public comment. I would ask that anyone, you know, basically, I believe there's a way to raise your hand in this um, um, peripheral. Uh, I don't know how to do it myself. Um, mm -hmm. But I would ask state your name, your address, and then your question, if you may. Dr. Hackett, do we have any movement? 
I am not seeing anything yet. Okay. Obviously, like anything else, if there are other questions, it's not hard. Go on the website. My cell phone's there. It's not hard to get in touch with me if there is a, a big issue. Okay. Um, I think we're at the, uh, I, we do know that at some point in time, obviously with everything finalized and things such as that, we'll be putting this budget on our website uh, with other information so that people will be able to log on and see how it is done. Um, I believe at this point we're um, open to a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. The motion. Second. Okay, we have second. Mr. Mayor. Aye. Ms. Soros. Aye. Ms. LaMaya. Aye. Ms. Dolan. Aye. Mr. Kokoros. Aye. Mr. Chafe. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Thank you very much. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.